Good day, everyone, and welcome uh, to You've Got the Power. We're gonna, we have an interesting topic today, uh, which is how does scoliosis and CCI relate? Can one cause the other? Uh, do you need to treat a CCI patient with scoliosis different than one without? Uh, so those are some of the things we'll be exploring. As usual, I'll give a short presentation and then I'll open it up to questions. Uh, you can ask questions about this topic or really any topic at all. It doesn't really make a difference uh, to me. Now you might be asking yourself, why is Dr. Centeno wearing a little jacket? Well, uh, it's been super cold here in Colorado. We've got the Arctic cold front coming through. I think the high yesterday was three. Today it's all the way up to nine. Uh, and I live in a Victorian home and I'm home uh, on an admin day right now. And we restored the Victorian home a while back, probably 15 years ago. And it was a complete redo, insulation, et cetera. But despite that, this house is not designed for these types of cold temperatures. So uh, it is what it is, part of living in a historic relic, if you will. Uh, but anyway, getting now to our topic, uh, just if you're joining us right now, we're going to be focusing on scoliosis and CCI and uh, how those two are interrelated. Does one cause the other? Um, is there uh, a different sort of treatment that needs to be undertaken if someone has scoliosis with CCI, et cetera, et cetera? So, let me uh, go ahead and uh, share my screen and then I'll start that presentation. So let's start with sharing my screen and then we'll go over uh, to scoliosis and CCI. Okay, so is there a relationship between scoliosis and CCI? Now this, this one came up because we have a pretty reasonable number of CCI patients who have some degree of scoliosis. Now, sometimes it's very mild, other times it's more significant. Uh, but I usually have this particular conversation with those patients who have more moderate or severe scoliosis and CCI. So I wanted to get this out there because, you know, again, this is a common conversation that I have with, uh, patients who have scoliosis and CCI. And if you happen to have scoliosis and CCI, it's probably good for you to hear as well. So these are the references that we'll be working off of today. So just to make sure we're gonna limit what we're talking about to one topic, because if we talk about scoliosis and, and CCI, there are two major issues. One is that you've got scoliosis down here, which is putting forces as things go up. And the other is that there's some problem with proprioception in the upper cervical spine, which is impacting the spine going down. We're going to be focusing on the first instance today and not the second. And the first instance is if there's already scoliosis below this area, how does it affect the upper cervical spine? So what is scoliosis? Scoliosis is a side bend of the spine and the inside curve is called the concave side. The outside curve is called the convex side. So you might hear if you have scoliosis, things like there's a levoconvex scoliosis. What does a levoconvex scoliosis means? It means the convexity or the outside of the curve is towards levo, which is the left. Dextro is the right. So dextroconvex scoliosis means that the convexity, the outside of the curve goes towards the right. And you can have lots of different scoliosis combinations as you see here. Now, one of the things you really need to understand to really dig into to today's topic is that in the spine, rotation and lateral bending are conjoined movements. Now, what do I mean by that? 
So this is my little spine model that I drew here. As usual, I do all these uh, illustrations. And uh, in this spine model, you can see that all the little spinous processes here are all nicely lined up in a row, straight up and down. So everything is nice and symmetrical. Uh, so it's very, 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 very straight. Now we go over to this spine model and I, and I've bent the whole thing. Uh, so now this is a scoliotic curve. And what happens when you bend the spine is you get rotation. Each one of these vertebrae, depending on where it lives, is going to rotate, uh, and that's a critical thing to understand. There's no such thing as just side bending in the spine without also seeing at the same time its conjoined movement, which is rotation. So if you've got side bending or scoliosis, you definitely have rotation. It's just how the spine is built. There's also this thing called the riding reflex, and this is a good one to understand. Uh, and that is that, you know, taking this guy over here with a scoliotic or side bent spine, we can see that his eyes are not aligned to the horizontal. The horizontal, the perpendicular is this way. So he's going to see the world kind of slanted. Uh, now, that doesn't really work for your, uh, for your neurologic system. So your neurologic system does this it writes you to the world and it gets your eyes horizontal to the perpendicular and by doing that it then changes what goes on down here and the same thing would happen if we had problems in the upper cervical spine giving bad information which we're not going to focus on today uh, but the similar thing occurs so just realize that your body is always going to try to write you to the horizontal. So if you look at all of that, and the biggest thing being that side bending causes rotation, then if someone's got a straight spine like this guy, everything's going to be nicely aligned. You're not going to see C1, C2 rotation. So this is going to be C1. This is going to be C2. But if we go to this guy, now we've got a scoliotic spine here. And because we have a scoliotic spine, we're going to see rotation imparted at C1, C2. Um, in fact, it's this scoliosis coming up here that is going to impart that rotation on C1, C2. And that rotation is largely fixed, right? It's being caused by the forces coming up from all the other rotated vertebrates. Uh, and so you may go to a chiropractor and try to get this treated and you might get it aligned, but it's gonna go out very, very quickly. Now, as you might imagine, if we have this kind of rotation that's being imparted from the bottom up, over time, those ligaments that prevent that rotation, and we already have a, a lecture on the idea of how the alar ligaments can limit C1, C2 rotation, those ligaments are gonna get stretched out. So you're going to get a type of CCI that's really caused by the scoliosis uh, and may not have anything to do with trauma. And if you also take the fact that scoliosis seems to be more common in patients that have hypermobile EDS, then those ligaments are not gonna be that strong to begin with. And we're gonna see the same thing, but even worse. So again, the key take home point for today is scoliosis below that C1 causes rotational forces at C1, C2. That can cause ligament support system to break down over time and these rotational forces will be constant. Meaning that unless you do something to the scoliosis down here, you're not going to change the rotational forces up there. Hence, helping patients with CCI and scoliosis requires treating the whole spine. Now, one of the problems can certainly be that the patient may not tolerate treating the whole thing at once. 
in which case probably best to start up top. Um, and we can perform in the right patients or eventually hopefully all patients once we get things calmed down with the CCI through something like a PICL procedure, we can go ahead and tighten the ligaments on this side. Those are called the intertransverse ligaments and the posterior thoracodorsal fascia because each one of these has a rotation. And we can treat some of the compressed joints or nerves in here to help with pain and to try to buttress the scoliosis. Now, we can't make someone normal, but we can try to help what's happening with those forces. And for patients who are less likely to tolerate multiple injection areas, we often begin with stabilizing the SI joints because the SI joints have the same rotational problem. So basically, when we get a scoliosis that happens, the SI joints start to get rotation. One part of the ilium goes forward, the other part of the ilium goes backwards. So we tend to see that kind of thing happening uh, when there's a scoliosis in the spine. So we can also really take care of the base of support for everything, the SI joints. And if there's instability there, we can treat those and then treat the top and then try to get to at some point treating in the middle. In addition, there are types of physical therapy that if you tolerate, you can do. One of those is called scroth. And scroth is a type of physical therapy where we're strengthening the muscles that are weak on one side and we are stretching the uh, areas that are tight. And it's a very good thing to consider. Again, not all CCI patients would tolerate it, but it's a great way to start in trying to use a physical therapy approach to see how much of that rotational force you can take off of C1, C2. So in summary, scoliosis can impart a rotational force in the upper cervical spine. This can degenerate ligaments over time. And when ligaments can be strengthened via procedures like PICL, the scoliosis also needs to be addressed at some point in most patients. Now, if you've got a very mild scoliosis, it may not be causing much of an issue at all. So I'm really talking about people who have more moderate and above type scoliosis. And physical therapy types like scroth may also help if they're tolerated. So let's get to some questions, see what we have there. And I'm just going to go, go ahead and get rid of all this. And we will go to some questions. Okay. So, uh, hi from Cali. Hi, Diane. It's been advanced by Robert Long. Do anterior C1 or DENS calcifications cause a concern for PICL outcome? And is there a prognosis? It's a good question. I don't know the answer to that one, Robert. My overall personal opinion would be uh, probably uh, that there's probably some issue there from the standpoint of the problem has been there much, much longer. And we're starting to see those uh, bone spurs that are an indication of that and or the patient's older. So things are going to be less malleable. Um, so my overall sense is probably, but I don't have data on that. Uh, we just started sort of looking at this and now I'm too hot. So we'll see when I get too cold uh, in my cold house here. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, but it's definitely something this last month or two that I've been thinking about looking at to see if it's an outcome indicator. Liam, do patients with less systemic inflammation heal faster in the last phase of PICL? Um, systemic inflammation is not a good thing. It's not a good thing for any healing, including from this kind of procedure. And how do we know you've got systemic or neurologically based inflammation? It's because rather than just flaring up for three to seven days, it goes on and on and on. And uh, so if you have a pretty sharp recovery curve of, yeah, I got flared up and then things came back down, that's a very good sign. It means you've got normal 
uh, resolution of inflammation. And it means that all things being equal, if I compare you to someone who's got out of control systemic inflammation, uh, you're probably going to do better. Uh, so that's a good, uh, good observation. Regenix, submitted advanced by DA. Are you born with scoliosis or something that develops over time? It's something that usually develops during the growth spurt. Now, not always, but that's why there's an entire type of scoliosis called adolescent scoliosis, because that's the most common time it seems to develop. Now, there's also a degenerative scoliosis, and that's as we age, things can also get side bent, but that's more to the individual spinal segments degenerating and slipping sideways, uh, not related to the growth spurt. So uh, adolescent scoliosis is that growth spurt uh, type scoliosis. Leo, do you think scoliosis co could cause levator scapular dysfunction thereby pulling on the upper cervical joints? Um, sure, uh, Leo, it will take the scapulas and move one up and one down. So for the one going down, that's going to be pulling on that levator scapula, which is going to pull that cervical spine over. Stacy, your topic is about scoliosis causing C-spine problems in my case until recently, so never had lumbar spine scoliosis. I've had patients who CCI cause your scoliosis. Yeah, Stacy, that's a little bit of a different topic for a different day, but um, it, it's possible, in my opinion, to get what I would call proprioceptive scoliosis. Now, this is not a common medical term. It'd be more a medical term that, that I just created, but it, it means that because of proprioceptive issues up here, and that writing reflects that we talked about, uh, and your body trying to get the writing reflex uh, uh, horizontal to the perpendicular, that some people do get a mild scoliosis due to upper cervical problems. Now, that wasn't really part of what we talked about because I had limited that because I didn't want this to go too long today. But it is a topic for another day, an important one. And, and that is that I believe there is another type of mild proprioceptive scoliosis that does happen. Uh, Liam, uh, before PICL, I tried AO a few times and it didn't seem to affect my symptoms. I thought maybe I was too loose to hold any adjustment. Should I just give it another go now, almost a couple of months since PICL? Sure. I think that's... Uh, definitely something that's reasonable to try as long as you feel comfortable with that provider. If you feel like that provider had things right, but it just wouldn't hold, then I, I would definitely do that. Ulysses, so C1, C2 cause scoliosis over time. Um, again, I think that proprioceptive scoliosis is real. I don't think it's been described in the peer-reviewed medical literature to date but it certainly makes sense that it would happen. And that is, again, because of abnormal proprioceptive or position sense input in the upper cervical spine and patients who have injured that area, they tend to do this. They tend to, let me, let's, go, let's go that way. Uh, they tend to help tilt their head and they don't really recognize it. And then they change their whole spine to try and now write themselves to the visual field. And then that can cause scoliosis, in my opinion. Uh, Robert, you need to be on a new TV doc show. Uh, yeah, thanks, Robert. I've actually done that before. It was on The Doctors many years ago. That was an interesting thing. I mean, I'm not even sure The Doctors is still a show, but it was back about 10, 15 years ago. Um, so that was interesting. I went out to California, did the whole, you know, makeup thing and yada, yada, yada. Probably the most interesting thing about that show was that I had a new suit uh, and uh, we had neglected to get it uh, hemmed. So the pants were too long. So I had to find a stapler at the hotel and staple my hem in. Um, I don't think anyone ever noticed, but it, it's a good story from that doctor's show. So if you can find that old doctor's show and watch it, look at my Look at my pants to see if you can notice the staples. Uh, Regenix, made in advance by Sherry. Uh, can you develop scoliosis as an adult or is it something you were born with? 
Uh, yeah. So uh, there are two main types of scoliosis, one being adolescent scoliosis, uh, and that means you develop it during the growth spurt. The other being um, degenerative, which is more adult onset, which happens as we get older. So it's really not happening anytime before the 50s, usually. And uh, where things get degenerative and start slipping sideways, causing a side bend. Stacy, does the bone spur and SI joint preclude successful treatment of scoliosis and CCI? Um, shouldn't, no, but I need to know a little bit more than that, but it shouldn't. Uh, it's been advanced by Jane Anderson. Is scoliosis treatable without surgery? They want to do surgery and then put me in a full torto body brace for a whole year. Yeah, Jane, so a lot of that depends on how much scoliosis is there. We have treated lots of scoliosis patients who never went on to surgery um, by doing what I talked about, buttressing the ligaments on the side of the convexity and treating some of the compressed joints on the other side. Now, um, you know, there's positives and negatives of scoliosis surgery. One of the positives would be that you can straighten somebody out to a reasonable degree. So if they're starting to get organ compromised, for instance, because one kidney is getting crushed uh, and because they've got very severe scoliosis, then maybe that needs to be done. The big downside of scoliosis surgery is it's a massive long fusion. And by creating a massive long fusion, we eventually see overload. So I generally see these scoliosis patients back at some point. And we've got to treat above and below the fusion because those sites are beginning to wear out. So it's a two-edged sword and one you wouldn't want to pull the trigger on unless you had very severe scoliosis and there was no other way to treat it. Ulysses, one of my x-rays shows I have scoliosis starting at T11. And I've had mad pain in my SI joint too. Um, sure, I mean, you can definitely get differential forces on the SI joint from scoliosis and, and get quite a bit of SI joint pain. Let's see, what if C4 through 7 has rotation force that can cause scoliosis too? Um, yeah, so, so again, all the other things below C1, C2 are going to impart a rotational force going up. So that would be part of that. Uh, Matt, if I had CCI for three years and get it treated, should I expect permanent nervous system damage? I mean, Matt, everyone's different there. It depends on so many different things, right? It would depend on the amount of force that those nerves are under. It would depend on the health of those nerves, all things being equal. It would depend on your genetics. Um, so all of those things and others go into determining who would get more permanent damage and who wouldn't and at what rate. So impossible to answer for any given person, meaning we see people who've had three years of this stuff and get it amount a complete recovery. Um, or we would also see people who are so severely injured at three years, they're probably never going to completely recover, but you know, hopefully we can make them substantially better. Arno, have you seen patients with cervical instability causing dysautonomia, which is then resolved after treatment? Uh, yes, Arno, we see lots of patients with uh, different types and manifestations of dysautonomia. Uh, and that could be everything from rapid heart rate uh, to POTS, et cetera. And then that dysautonomia component goes away, GI problems, et cetera. Um, so that would be a pretty common thing that we're looking for to resolve. And I've got a blog on, on what causes that. Um, but yes, that's pretty common. Lissy, can I use a brace for my scoliosis since it relates to CCI had mild scoliosis? So if you've got mild scoliosis, probably doesn't make sense to brace. Bracing is more for moderate or severe scoliosis patients. And like any brace, it can cause weakness. So we'd only want to use that if you were in a pinch situation and if it really felt much, much better, right? Maybe for travel, for example. Uh, Katarina Broncos Perez, is it generally medically accepted that spinal fluid pressure or high low is influenced by skeletal muscle 
muscular imbalances, i.e. pelvic tilt, loss of lordosis, more related to topic, severe scoliosis. I don't think we have much data on, I, I think what you're really discussing here, I'm, I'm thinking, is intracranial hypertension and those things. We can certainly see changes that are demonstrable on CSF flow MRIs um, in patients who have various differences in their spinal morphology. That could be scoliosis, that be, could be kyphosis, that could be decreased space behind the dens and in front of the spinal cord or cervical medullary syndrome. Uh, so we definitely see that happen with uh, changes in cerebral spinal fluid that can be measured on MRI. Uh, Katarina, do you typically ice pack after a dural leak to assist clotting? Usually not needed. Um, uh, something's going to clot, it's going to clot. You're not going to make the clot any better um, by putting an ice pack on there. Um, in fact, uh, you're probably not even going to get the ice to that depth unless you're extremely, extremely thin, um, meaning that ice will only change the blood flow down to probably about a half of an inch. Anything below that, you're really not doing much to if you're putting ice on there because the body's response is going to be increasing the blood flow in that area to try to compensate. Um, uh, just like if you go outside and it's cold, your skin, you know, and it's three degrees, um, you might get some burn on your skin under certain circumstances, but your, all of your skin doesn't slough off because your body is constantly throwing blood through that area, trying as best it can to dissipate that cold. The same thing happens when you put ice on. So um, you really don't need ice, an ice pack after uh, a, a dural leak uh, to assist in the clotting. No, it's either gonna clot or it's not gonna clot. If it doesn't clot, then you get a blood patch um, or, and if that doesn't work, you can get PRP, platelet-rich plasma injected uh, in that area. Uh, Ulysses, can a chiropractor help with scoliosis like AO or a Blair? Well, certainly if it's being caused by this issue up here, then an AO chiropractor or NUCA chiropractor would be very helpful um, to see if that changes that proprioceptive scoliosis. I know if a ligament is ruptured, are you able to treat it? What if it's only like partial rupture, it's so a partial tear? Yeah, Arno, 99% of these ligaments aren't ruptured as much as they're stretched. Uh, so it's very rare. Uh, I think we've only seen it a few times on MRI to see a ligament that's torn back like a rubber band and pulled apart. More often, what you see is damage to the ligament fibers that allows the ligament uh, to permit too much motion. So we generally don't see a ruptured and pulled back like a rubber band uh, ligament. It just doesn't happen uh, all that often. And uh, in fact, we usually see the bone, bones break before that happens. Uh, so that's good news. Um, and now we will see chiropractors sometimes use that in DMX reports. And I think that's more does more harm than good. Um, you know, they might say, you know, evidence of a ruptured right alar ligament. Well, they don't really know that from the DMX at all. Um, so using that kind of verbiage is more about maybe playing the medical legal system than it is about actual medicine. Uh, Eric, uh, as a rotatory subluxation of C1C2 can cause a compensatory scoliosis in the neck, thoracolumbar or spine will correct by itself if C1C2 are properly stabilized. Yeah, Eric, so what we're talking about there is that that top-down approach. Now, today's lecture was about the bottom-up concept, right? Scoliosis down here, leading to problems and rotation in the upper cervical spine. As we've been discussing, um, it is possible to have appropriate proprioceptive scoliosis, where because of uh, differential position sense coming from the upper neck, you tend to get a compensatory mild curve. So if you've got a compensatory mild curve due to proprioceptive scoliosis, then yes, if C1C2 are properly stabilized, that should go away. But a lot of that would depend on how long that's been there, whether or not the bones have started to change shape. 
um, because your body is very good at adapting to what it's being uh, given. So if it's being given something like this, then it will it will adapt to that over time. So a lot of that depends on how long that's been there and whether or not it's started, starting to get or st has started to get baked in. Uh, Ulysses, uh, if you have mild scoliosis, it is impossible to feel the bone in each spine after all ligaments and tendons has stretched out. Not sure what you're asking there. Ulysses, how hold on how the hips to sins. Not quite sure what you're asking there. Uh, mes, mes, mes one. Uh, is scoliosis from CCI, your neurologic message is being disrupted by the instability and resulting irritation of the nervous brainstem. Again, that's more of that, uh, that proprioceptive mild scoliosis that we see. And again, just to sort of go through that. So uh, let's say I'm getting, I injured my right C2-3 facet joint. My body tells me now that this is straight up and down. Now, my writing reflex, the, the world is tilted right now. So my writing reflex is going to do that to try and get my eyes as level as possible. Well, that's going to cause a proprioceptive scoliosis, meaning that my uh, the information is bad coming from the upper cervical spine. My body is trying as best it can to write my eyes to the horizontal visual field. And hence, I've got scoliosis because of bad information from here. Now, if we fix the bad information from here, that should go away, assuming it hasn't been there so long that the bones and everything else have started to change shape. Uh, Bethany, hi, Dr. Nina. I, I have a right head tilt, and you mentioned that I may have scoliosis. Would you need me to send you all levels of my spine for review? I'm two months post PICL. I'm wondering if scoliosis should be treated my second PICL. Great, Bethany. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I think the answer is yes. If you've got a standing uh, full series, meaning a standing x-ray full spine, uh, that would be great to see. So we can get a sense of how much scoliosis or side bend is there. Um, and... A lot of that will just depend on what you can tolerate. So um, if you had a real hard time recovering from PICL, then we would probably do less. If you didn't have a hard time recovering from PICL, we would probably do more. So that's how that would work. But the answer is that would be wonderful to see. Uh, as I always say, I'll never turn down more information. Uh, more information is always better than less. Matt. Should one take stem cell support formula and fish all before or after PICL to improve stem cell counts? Yeah, we recommend that, Matt. Um, and uh, the only big thing on the fish oil is realize that the fish oil can go ahead and thin out your blood. So you should stop that about two days before the procedure and then get back on it right after the procedure. Um, so you might get a little bit more excessive bleeding if you're on fish oil um, during the procedure. So stop it. 40 hours before, add it right back after. You know, one of the good things about fish oil is the, uh, the presence of what are called resolvins. Resolvins are substances that can resolve inflammation or tamp it down. So it's one of the real advantages of being on fish oil after something like a PICL, especially if you've got an exaggerated inflammatory response or, or systemic inflammation is that that can help push that inflammation down. Uh, Ulysses, can the hips be misaligned because of the SI joints uh, and also scoliosis too? Uh, yeah, I mean, not so much, well, yeah. So if, it, so if one, let's think about this. If one ilia or ilium is forward and the other one's backwards, then that's going to impact the hip joint itself. That's going to change the range of motion of those hips side to side. Uh, Ulysses, I was rubbering, rubbing my back and feel my bones. It thoracic lumbar. It means, yeah, I'm not quite sure what that means, Ulysses. And the next one it looks like it's an ad, so I'm not going to click on that one. 
okay, so what we're talking about today is scoliosis and how that can cause or impart rotational forces in the high upper cervical spine. Uh, happy to answer any questions about that or any other topic, any other questions out there. Uh, please feel free to write those in the comments there. Uh, while we're waiting for some more questions, I didn't include that slide I forgot to, but again, if you're interested in reaching out for an appointment, you know, our call center is great, but they deal with lots of different things. And I find that the uh, needs of CCI patients are pretty unique, uh, meaning that you guys, for instance, have a lot more imaging than the average knee ACL tear, for example. So because of that, you know, I really think that reaching out to my assistant, Carla Salas, and I just put her information in uh, the comments there, uh, is the way to go uh, because she can generally get you, help you navigate through that system much more quickly. Uh, Jeanette, uh, with downward scoliosis, could the cause with the jaw not being in its optimum position? No, usually it's the upper cervical spine. So now upper cervical spine frequently um, crosses over to jaw problems. So just realize that um, you may have an upper cervical problem causing the jaw issue, and then the upper cervical problem causes that downward scoliosis that we were talking about. Uh, by then, my dens is off midline, at least 10 millimeters due to hemivertebra. Seems this is causing off midline brainstem to skull, having strong sensory issues. Um, yeah, so I need to look at that. What you're, what you're saying is you only have part of, I'm assuming the atlas there, is that the hemivertebra? Um, and as a result, your dens is off by a centimeter. Um, uh, so I need to know more, but I think what you're saying is that you've got some bad information coming from that area, and maybe you're getting some banging into of the dura or covering of the spinal cord, and that's causing some sensory issues. Megan, when intermittent fasting or traditional fasting, is there a time frame? when it can turn from helpful to harmful. Yeah, I mean, I think if you pushed it to an extreme, yes. So I think that's why it's better to do something like FMD, a fasting mimicking diet. So if you go online and look up Prolon, P-R-O-R-L-O-N, uh, that's a fasting mimicking diet. And the goal there is to try and uh, give person a reasonable number of calories, but a low number. And uh, that's a five-day program. So that's a good one. Um, and listen, you know, we're in America, right? There's, there's very few of us that if we fasted for five days before a procedure are going to put ourselves into a state of malnutrition. Um, so that's why this works. Now, if we were trying this in India, it may not work so well. Katrina, can you link to the IPA website in the comments too, please? Uh, sure. Let me, let me find their information and I'll do that. IPA physical therapy going into the comments right now. That's their website. Uh, Stacy, what is your next long sailing vacay? Would you like to get more local prep done before next BICL with you spring or summer? Yeah, so Stacy, I will be gone from April 23rd to June 3rd, I think is what it is, something like that. Um, and uh, so that's when I'll be out of the office. Arno, I get vibrating sensations under my skin in my neck. Can this be a result of CCI AAI, not tremors, but vibrations like an electric toothbrush being pushed into my neck? Um, it can. Uh, so the first thing, obviously, is to rule out all of the obvious neurologic problems that can cause things like that. Uh, so that would be an MRI of the brain, MRI of the neck, trying to make sure there's not a tumor someplace causing that. And obviously then to get cleared by neurology so that there's not some rare neurologic disease that's causing that. 
that we can't image. But in that scenario, then we would next look for things like CCI, uh, ACI, or CCI, AAI, sorry. By then, C7 is Hemi. Oh, that's a little different scenario. So um, I'd have to see what that looks like. Now, if what you're telling me is that rather than being a, a square, it's off like that, then absolutely, that'll impart a lot of rotational force higher up. Um, so I'd, I'd need to see that. Mandy, I was diagnosed with CCI a few years ago, and now I'm experiencing thoracic spine instability and rotated hips and a very lax shoulder. I've been doing PT for years without seeing any improvement. Should I, should I be focusing on CCI first and all the things that are unstable rotated? Um, yeah, a lot of that. Certainly, I think you'd want to now start getting worked up for treatment because just remember, Mandy, the, the biggest problem I think that we have, and I talk about a lot on this show, is that if you leave this stuff for any length of time, you know, the changes can get baked in. And what I mean by baked in is that you can get neurologic damage that then is not fixable. So definitely best to try to get the CCI dealt with and obviously those other issues evaluated to see what of those things would need to be treated at the same time. Stacy, an idea why increased numbers of CCI patients are noting that multivitamins make their symptoms worse. No idea. Uh, and again, be a little careful. I always tell patients this with what you read on social media, because it tends to be the loudest voices that get noticed, not the, the most prevalent voices. So what I mean by that is lots and lots of people lurking in the background that never comment who maybe are taking multivitamins and never have any issues, but the loud three that comment seem to be the one that get focused on. Uh, but no, I haven't noticed that at all or heard that from patients. Not quite sure what that one means. So these are just uh, the IPA physical therapist uh, email or I'm sorry, web link. So uh, click on that to find one of those therapists. Sure, Katrina, happy to help. It's been advanced by DB. How much does chronic inflammation affect procedure results? I've not been able to get a diagnosis for my inflammatory issues. Well, I've tried, but it seems to affect everything from food to smells to environmental issues like mold, dental work, etc. Is there anything that can be done for those types of inflammatory issues? Single biggest thing that anyone can do for inflammatory issues is get down to your 18 year old weight. That is the single biggest thing that anyone can do in the United States or really any part of the developed world. Um, you know, once you're at your 18 year old weight, um, then you can start to look at whether or not there are other things that can be fixed or, or be dealt with. Uh, obviously getting to your 18 year old weight requires a different diet, et cetera. But that's the biggest single thing um, to reduce inflammation. Um, and so, you know, these other things that we talk about that could cause um, increased inflammation uh, certainly may be there. But until we get you down to normal weight, and I, what I mean by normal weight is the weight you weighed at 18 years old, um, it's going to be very, very hard for us to sort that out in it with any accuracy. Lizzie, uh, it's sad that no doctor could help patients with CCI, especially if they have scoliosis. Not sure what that one means. We help CCI patients all day, but I'm, so I don't know what that one means. Uh, Matt, uh, do you look for at MRIs for tethered cord in a consultation? Uh, we do, Matt, but just realize that there's two kinds of tethered cord. There's the kind of tethered cord that can be seen on MRI, and uh, that's where the cord terminus is pulled way down. So it's usually around T12L1. Let's say it's pulled down to L2. Um, then there's an occult tethered cord, which is a completely different animal. Um, and occult tethered cord, much harder to diagnose on an MRI. There's some thought that maybe you can use a prone MRI, but no one's really ever published much data on that. Um, and uh, there's a thought that you can use your dynamic studies. The problem there is most people with chronic back pain have abnormal urodynamics and they don't have tethered cord. 
So you've got a test there that has very, very, very low, uh, uh, not highly specific, let's put it that way. So yes, we talk about it, but uh, conceptually a colt tethered cord is a different animal. That means we're trying to cut the cord terminus, um, not based on the usual diagnostic criteria for tethered cord. Again, a colt tethered cord being a different animal than tethered cord. And once we cut that phylum terminale, the thing that anchors the cord, we abnormally change the central nervous system in that patient from a structural standpoint forever, meaning there's no going back. So we don't want to do that unless we're absolutely certain that there's no other way to help the patient. So we see patients diagnosed with occult tethered cord all the time. We end up treating their neck. Their problems go away. They never had an occult tethered cord, even though they were told they did. So just be a little careful with that one. Um, okay, guys. So uh, we're at 146. Going to hold a minute or two for some questions here. Uh, to come in. Again, I'll put my assistant's uh, email address below. So if you want to get a consultation or in any way uh, be seen by somebody, that's the way to go. Uh, let's see. Um, by Van, uh, would a cult tethered cord be caused by an amputation of the coccyx? Uh, possible. Um, usually an amputation of the coccyx, since that's where the phylum might terminate, might weaken the phylum. So sort of do the, the opposite. The, the cord would go, the cord terminus would go up, not down. But it's possible there could be some scarring there. Um, but, you know, more likely uh, not. Uh, meaning that uh, just be careful with that diagnosis. That diagnosis is thrown around a lot off some weak data. And once you get the cord terminus cut, there's no going back. It is what it is. That's that, Those are permanent changes in your central nervous system forever that can't be repaired. So if it helps, everyone's happy. If it makes you worse, not my problem is going to be the attitude of the surgeon. Stacy, sure. Thanks, Stacy. Lissy, I was talking about doctors in New York City. They don't help nobody. Gotcha. Uh, mes, mes, mes one. There is an accentuation of the lateral lateral joint and head rotation measuring 45 degrees to 49 degrees. Left head rotation. You could said no instability. Um, that's a little bit more rotation than should be at C1, C2, but that's not normally the way we diagnose uh, C1, C2 instability here in the United States. So that's based on a paper by Dvorak et al. Um, and let's go to Dvorak's paper here. Uh, hold on a second here. Find it first. Share my screen. So, uh, so this is the paper that that's based off of, and uh, fifty-six degrees um, is considered hypermobile. So it looks like you came in just below that and more than an eight degree difference from side to side, um, or I'm sorry, greater than five degrees. Oh, that's actually C1, C2, it's greater than eight degrees. So, uh, so that's why they didn't call that unstable. Now, does that mean that you're not unstable? No, you may have lateral bending C1, C2 overhang and still have those numbers. So there's more uh, evaluation to be done there. 5M, my doctor seems I may have tethered cord from birth, congenital tailbone surgery. Meaning they, they probably didn't do a tailbone operation when you were in the womb. So maybe you're just 
don't have a tailbone, uh, so it's not amputated, but just congenitally not present. Again, as I said, be very, very careful with the whole tethered cord diagnosis thing because, you know, we're increasingly see patients, increasingly seeing patients get these surgeries. And from what I've seen, the results are pretty mixed, um, meaning, you know, we get lots of patients who are much worse after this and there's nothing we can do. Uh, we've got several patients, we've had several patients now with chronic dura leaks because they have to go into the dura. So just be careful. Um, there are certainly people out there who probably need the surgery, um, but it seems to be a small fraction of the number that are getting the surgery. Lissy, which side to sleep with mild scoliosis with CCI2? Uh, that de depends on so much stuff, it's, it's hard to answer, Ulissi. So, uh, for instance, if you had more C1C2 overhang when you're laying on, or, or, or when you're going to the right, then obviously you'd want to stay away from sleeping on your left, things like that. So it's pretty specific. Stacy, any best time of day to take fish oil with or, what, with or without food? Yeah, I think uh, just taking it once a day um, in the morning with food. Lissy, which side to sleep on? I got you. I got that. That was, yeah. Yes, I know, uh, Mez, that that was a rotation CT. That's the paper I just showed you. That was a paper that was published back in 19, 1987. So that's what that measurement is based off of, that Dvorak, Dvorak et al. paper. And again, what it talked about was that the rotational max was 56 degrees. Um, and yours came in below that. So that's why they called it normal. Doesn't mean you don't have instability. It just means on that test, you didn't show it. Uh, Vivan, if C1, C2 on rotation has difference between the two vertebra is 43 degrees. Dr. Frazierhan says anything over 40 degrees is excess mobility. Um, not based on that Dvorak paper. Um, so that's the one we just looked at. Um, so that was 56 degrees uh, was the max at C1, C2 that you were allowed to have, meaning they did nine healthy adults um, and 43 patients with cervical spine injury. Um, so not according to that paper. By then, no, I had surgery for congenital coccyx that has cyst, extra skin, and extra bone to the clip of file. Okay, so you had a congenital coccyx deformity of some sort, and then they took your coccyx out. So I need to know a little bit more about why they took your coccyx out because it was hurting. Did you have coccydynia, that kind of thing? Uh, Katarina, my OMTDO has said my imaging is enough to refer me for CCI. I have subluxation of C2 and C3 deflection three millimeters and borderline Chiari, but my C reactive is slightly elevated. I had prolotherapy dextrose and had a bad experience. My vertigo and other symptoms got worse. Just suggest getting my inflammation down first. You know, most prolotherapy is done blind. So sometimes people get worse because structures are hit that shouldn't be hit. So I need to know more about the kind of prolotherapy that you had done exactly where they injected. Was it with imaging guidance, uh, with or without contrast, for instance, under x-ray, um, under ultrasound, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I need to know a little, little more there. Uh, Megan, is there a type of or brand of fish oil you recommend? Um, sure, I like Nordic Naturals. Uh, that's what I take every day. Um, and that is these guys. I don't make any money from Nordic Naturals, um, but this is the one I take. Uh, they do a molecular filtration, so they get all the junk out that can be uh, that can be concentrated in, in fish, um, and so it's a pretty good brand. So that's what I use. Uh, Let's see, can muscle spasms add on to scoliosis, scoliosis issues too? 
Certainly, Ulysses uh, muscle spasms can pull you to the side um, if they're on one side or the other. Yes. Katrina is with x-ray guidance. Yeah, so Katrina, now I probably need to know who did the procedure and uh, x-ray guidance with contrast or without contrast, um, meaning that those are two different levels. One is to use the x-ray to just kind of put the needle someplace. The other is to use the x-ray uh, to inject very specific structures, in which case radiographic contrast is used. Arno, when I rotate my head left and right, I can feel two bones scraping against each other and this all day, any time of the day. Is it because of my laxity of a cervical ligament? Could be, yeah. I mean, that's that could be caused by extra motion at C1, C2. Katerina, a few days later, I ended up with ER with high glucose, not normal for me, and high leukocytes, I believe. Um... So the question is, are you diabetic um, or pre-diabetic? Uh, that would be the big question there, meaning that uh, for a normal person to have high glucose, high glucose by definition means diabetes, meaning there is no such thing as a high glucose in someone who's normal um, and who doesn't have diabetes. So I need to know more there. Mark, uh, what is recommended clinical correlation for paraspinal muscle spasms on cervical MRI report? Um, I'm not quite sure how someone would diagnose that off of an MRI report. So I think maybe they saw um, some scoliosis and maybe they thought it had something to do with um, it pulling the spine. I, I'd need to look at the images. I don't, I don't read MRI reports all that often. Uh, Mark will read them for things like, is there a tumor that we might have missed? But for things like this, it's much, much easier to read the MRI report in front or the MRI in front of the patient and look at what exactly it is they're talking about. By then, my massage therapist had a gentle grasp of muscles and neck and tingling and pelvis feet versus immediately descending paresthesia. Yeah, so that certainly could indicate that there's some irritation around the spinal cord. So we'd probably want to look at your cervical MRI to see if there's something like cervical stenosis there. Sure, you listen. Uh, Okay, guys, any other questions here? We're at 157. I usually go an hour. So any other questions I can, last minute questions I can answer. Again, today's topic was about scoliosis and CCI. Uh, we were talking about how the side bend in scoliosis as it goes up can impart a permanent rotational force at C1, C2, so that in some of those patients, you need to treat the scoliosis in addition to the CCI. Um, Sure, Stacy. happy to help. Any other questions I can answer today? Okay, guys, so thanks so much for watching. I probably will be here this coming Friday. Uh, we're gonna be getting into conference season coming up here pretty soon. So I'll be traveling a little bit more in February and then a lot more in April, because that's kind of you know prime time conference season. And I lecture a lot, so I'll be at various conferences lecturing, usually on the Fridays, so I can usually do the Mondays. But uh, I will, I think, be here this Friday. So you all have a uh, great uh, week. And then by then, can you do CCI and venous elevated pressures and brain topic? I've already done that one. Um, so by then, if you just go ahead and search my YouTube channel for intracranial hypertension, that should come up. So intracranial hypertension. Um, so that one should come up there. You can also look under internal jugular vein uh, IJV or internal jugular vein. Those are two topics uh, where we have that whole thing uh, dialed in. And I think I've talked about it at least once or twice already. Uh, Superfly, can cervical instability affect wound healing or collagen formation? I'm working a physical job experiencing 
the clicking dizziness, but we've also accumulating muscle strains. Yeah, not so much the healing of those muscle strains, but it can impart differential forces on different muscles, not giving them a chance to heal. Um, okay, guys, uh, that's the last question I'm going to take for today. Have a great week, and I will see you this coming Friday. Thank you.